um, I changed my title. So, um, and I was asked to be provocative. So, like, um, <laughs> and for the people in Emerge who don't know me, it's obvious why I was asked. But, okay. So, um, and I, I'm, I'm taking my clinician hat here and also my ClinGen hat because I spend now, I, we could have just called this a ClinGen meeting and you could have gotten three for the price of two. Um, a, a number of the members of the steering committee are here. Um, and I've just really become more and more convinced how difficult it actually is to classify variants and report them. Um, so I'm quite troubled by the potential difficulty in effectively classifying the variants on the list for reporting as incidental findings. Some have obviously extremely clear loss of function phenotypes, but missense alleles, as many of you in the lab know, are much more difficult to classify. The ACMG classification rules may approve our ability to classify variants, but as you heard from uh, Gail, that still is not easy and takes a lot of work. Uh, and in particular, I've had the clinical experience and personal experience, actually, of having reclassification of variants from pathogenic to benign or VUS, and that is troubling, and I think it's particularly troubling in the incidental finding setting. Um, our goal here is not to do harm. And I did have the hypothesis, and you'll see I was wrong about this, that some genes may be too no, new to know the spectrum well. Uh, and some genes have a very broad phenotype. And this has definitely come up in our own reporting of incidental findings. The table lists one phenotype. But in fact, when you go into OMIM, there's five phenotypes. And so what are you really telling the patient they're at risk for? Um, and I have to say, my complete bias Start going into this was that incidental finding reporting was easier for cancer genes and cardiovascular genes. Um, and just to highlight some issues about reclassifying variants, so this is a beautiful paper that came out in uh, uh, the New England Journal about misdiagnosis of cardiovascular uh, pathogenic alleles in African Americans. It was based on this genetics and medicine classification of variants of a very large group of patients who are not incidental findings for cardiovascular disease. And I think at the previous meeting we talked to this, about this, but basically there were a number of patients with African American, African American patients where the allele, in fact, once we had more population data, is way too common to actually be responsible for the phenotype the patient had. So I just, I'm a clinician, so I just wanted to give you three case examples. And one happened yesterday, so thanks Kate Nathanson uh, for this. So in 2004, when I was still doing adult genetics, I saw an extremely nervous 29-year-old postdoc who had a single retinal hemangioma. Uh, I sent off testing at what was considered the top lab, and that's not the Baylor lab, the, um, the lab that's been used by the VHL um, NIH program for many years. Um, and I found, I keep paper copies, so I found the record. Um, and uh, it was reported to have this intronic variant. The report is completely straightforward in that this is pathogenic. So there was no wiggle room in the original report. It's pathogenic. This variant's been shown to have a messenger RNA defect. Uh, and that was all stated on the report. So I told this unbelievably nervous person that they did have VHL. And I have to say, this had huge impact on him. So this is not a minor diagnosis. Uh, and he, but he went on with his career and moved uh, to Philadelphia and is now a faculty member. And so 12 years later, he came in uh, to see Kate, and she looked up his allele in ClinVar, being a very uh, conscientious clinician, and now multiple labs called it benign, and in fact, it's found in something like 4.5% of Han Chinese, uh, and he was Chinese. Um, and he, in fact, has not developed any other signs of VHL. So he probably did just have an isolated sing single retinal hemangioma and has spent you know, 12 or 15 years with this diagnosis. In our own CSER project, we've had two uh, incidental findings uh, that have been reclassified, both before the ACMG guidelines. One very similar to the New England Journal paper, a DSP allele uh, that had been reported to be pathogenic, which now, based on exact data, is certainly way too common. Uh, and then we've had both a symptomatic patient and an incidental finding with the same LDLR, missense allele, uh, which was reclassified as a VUS, now using the ACMG classification scheme, although, frankly, I've spent a lot of time delving into this variant. I still can't really tell if it's pathogenic or uncertain. I guess that's why it's uncertain. But this is really more a question of the reclassification based on better rules.
So what did I do for this talk? I took the ACMG list. I went through every one of them on OMIM, which was quite interesting to do, actually. Uh, and I focused on the cancer and cardiovascular genes. So one of my hypotheses was that some of these genes are too new. So I looked at the date that the gene was first published. Um, and I just did before anything before 2000 or the date after 2000. I looked at, in the literature, I tried to look at what are the majority of the alleles. I tried to look at other features. I looked at segregation. And I also looked at whether there was an expert panel in ClinVar. So this is my main data. OK, so there's about comparable number of cancer and cardiovascular genes on the ACMG59. Uh, it turns out the vast majority of them were identified before 2000s. No offense to the Human Genome Project, but almost all of them were identified in the, in the 1990s. Um, the cardiovascular genes do have more new genes, but you'll see they're really not that new. Uh, there are actually only six genes on the list that have an expert panel in ClinVar. They're all cancer genes. Uh, the primary, the primary um, mutational spectrum being loss of function is much, much more common in the cancer genes, so I was right about that. Uh, there's a small number of genes that have almost equal loss of function and missense, and then the genes where the primary mechanism of disease is missense is much more common in cardiovascular, and I think, I think that is a, a potential problem. With regard to age, so these are the actual dates of all the genes that were discovered after 2000. You can see this line is 10 years ago. So in fact, mo very few new genes on the list. So it's not really an issue of newness. We've had at least 10 years to learn about the spectrum of mutation in most of these. OK, so what are the other complications? So there, most of them are dominant. There is one X-linked Fabrase, and I just looked on the table again, and it recommends only reporting in males, although we all, well, those of us who do are clinicians, there is clearly a female phenotype, so we could argue about that. There's one autosomal recessive, um, UYH, so do you report singles? I think these are all things that labs, even if the guidelines are thinking about, the labs are going to struggle with each time. What was really striking to me is how, in OMIM is how many of these genes actually have both dominant and severe recessive phenotypes. Um, so again, you've got to kind of do, do you, when you're disclosing this, do you have to explain, well, OK, also now you're a carrier for this rare severe phenotype. Um, there are a couple that, um, the, one of the long QTs, and I'm wrong about this slide, is digenic, but it is also monogenic. So, but do you have to look for the other allele? Because that, again, is a more severe condition. Um, and a few of them really only have very few, and this was just mentioned, uh, very few alleles. So TM43 and SEHAF2, if you go into ClinVar, each one of them only has one pathogenic allele, uh, and one has, I think, less than five pathogenic alleles. Um, the bigger issue that I'm just trying to get to is there's an incredibly wide range of quality of information. So BRCA1 is on that list, OK? There are thousands of documented alleles, thousands of papers, frankly, and there's an expert panel. And then you have genes that have only a few well-documented alleles, like MUTE-YH and a variety of others. And then you have some extremely rare conditions. Um, you also have some other messy things, like PMS2. You could be calling a pseudogene, and you actually have to do a fair amount of work to know that it's not a mutation in a pseudogene. Um, and then there are a number of these that have substantial genetic modifiers. So the phenotype, again, is very different uh, depending on the presence of a modifier. So I have to be honest. That's part of the reason I asked to give this talk. I'm not clear we're doing an overall good by reporting incidental findings. Um, but I think even though we've known some of these genes for decades, reporting variants in many of these genes continues to be quite difficult. And I would suggest that perhaps we should consider really substantially simplifying the current recommendations. Um, I would consider, and I, I didn't make a suggestion to the, to the committee, so um, considering dropping even a few more of these very rare or recessive conditions, unless they're really common. But my main recommendation is I actually think we need a much clearer definition for the labs of exactly what should be reported for each of these genes in the setting of incidental findings. The labs were not asked, they're not being asked to look at this gene because of the patient's phenotype. I think we need a very strict loss of function definition 
Um, I know there's some BRCA1 variants that look all the world like expected pathogenic, which the committee continues to use that terminology that in fact are not because there's a splice product that's bit present in 10% of genes, in 10% of transcripts that splices out those exons, so it doesn't actually matter that you have a nonsense mutation in either of those two exons. So even saying expected pathogenic can get you into trouble. I think we actually have to have for each gene a very strict definition of what loss of function means. I personally would recommend that for the genes that have missense mutations, that an expert panel has a list of missense mutations and you don't report the others. Um, you don't have to sit there and classify each of the other ones. Um, and that um, if there are any other specific comp complications, like a common modifier, that there be a clear rule. You look for it or you don't. Um, and then I think for the clinicians receiving the results, I think we need a fact sheet from the ACMG or another committee for each of these disorders that say, if found in the setting of an incidental finding, these are things to consider, similar to what we have for newborn screening. Because I think right now it's actually, I've disclosed some of these cardiovascular ones. I think it's actually quite difficult. And I'm sure the people that don't do cancer feel the same thing about the cancer ones. Thanks. Maybe one question? Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, hi, Liz. Hi. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, and it dovetails with Wendy's uh, uh, presentation also, I actually find it uh, paradoxically really gratifying and really disappointing that 55 of the 56 genes on the original recommendations are still in the recommendations. And that was always felt to be a first approximation, recognizing many of the issues that you present. Uh, but I think that the presentation you make that it's, you know, it's kind of, it's hard to do these things. I, my general impression uh, in medicine is that it's generally difficult to keep people from dying. And that if we get up and complain to the world that golly gee whiz willikers, it's, it's hard to do this, I don't know that that's going to generate a lot of sympathy or really help us do what we need to do. I, I, I'm okay with things being a little bit hard, but I think the definition and the problem needs to be reframed in what do you want the positive predictive value of a secondary finding to be, right. and what do you want the sensitivity to be? Right, and I would love it to be 100% sensitive and 100% positive predictive value, as would you, and we don't get that. Right. Uh, and I can drive PPV close to 100 and comp almost completely wipe out sensitivity and vice versa. Right. What do you want it to be? I mean, because if, if you could frame it that way, then right. we can tune these things to do whatever you in the community want. I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit. So I agree that we should certainly do things that are hard. I think the issue of doing things that are really hard in the setting of incidental findings is quite different. Okay, So I would prefer, and many of you who are in CSER know, I've argued for four years that we spend too much time talking about incidental findings. Um, and up here, here I am doing it. Um, <laughs> I would prefer the lab put their effort into making the best diagnosis for my patient they can. Okay, that's number one. Number two is I think it's not simply sensitivity and specificity. What I'm trying to say is it's not as simple as saying, here's a missense allele that we know causes whatever long QT. It's also the fact that you, the clinician's gonna look up that gene and discover, oh, well, some of them have sudden death and some of them have brigada and some of them have whatever. So I think if we're gonna continue to do this, we need to have a much clearer, and I, frankly, we've worked with oncologists who are not, you know, I mean, they refer the patient to a cardiologist, but I think we have to really arm the clinician with much better information about if this is found in an incidental finding, this is what you need to know. I do think the specificity, I, I mean, without sitting down and really doing numbers, I think the specificity should be significantly higher than it is. I just think that the genetics is much messier than we realize, and you quickly get into issues about modifiers and things like that in an incidental finding, which is not necessarily where most clinicians want to be spending their time. Yeah, but I actually think but, that gets back to the 55 still there. I think 
the, the, all the things you say are true, and I don't want to wring my hands about it or moan and wail. I just actually want to just get to where we want to get. And I think it's actually true for everything we're going to try and do in predictive medicine. Yeah. And I think that's a great reason for Emerge and Caesar to be together, because this is our challenge writ large. And if it's hard with 59 genes, it's going to be impossible with 5,000. Yeah. And so we, we have to just, these are pretty straightforward questions. How predictive do you want it to be? And some of the genes, and I think the, some of the cardiomyopathy genes are candidates for being dropped for some of these reasons. And I agree with you that the cancer ones I, we're finding are generally less of a problem for us. And right, so and I would just comment one thing that Gail emailed me is it's not simply, so I, I, I just want to simple it. So for example, the genes that only have two pathogenic alleles, if you want to leave that gene on the list, then just put that gene, that allele, and stop having labs feel like they have to at least look at every other variant in that gene, which is what they currently feel like they have to do. Yeah. So I think specificity of the list could also be helpful. Yeah. And we're actually doing great. Yes. Yeah. 